Okay, I want to look at a couple more things here. We, we talked about work. Now I want to go back and look at a couple of things. That way we can go back and look at heat. So the transfer of energy through heat here. Um, cool, let's put a couple things up here. This is a word we mentioned earlier, adiabatic. What does adiabatic mean? No heat exchange. What does it mean in a mathematical expression? Q equals zero. And now we're going to extrapolate that. Oh, well, shoot. If, if I have an adiabatic process, what else would be true? <coughs> Delta U equals W. Do you have to memorize that? No, derive it every time. You should know what the definition of adiabatic is and then be able to apply it. OK. Let's take this one other step. Isothermal, what does that mean? Constant temperature, so the change in temperature is zero. And we alluded to this earlier because the kinetic energy of a gas is proportional to its temperature. Then if the temperature doesn't change, what would be true? Delta U would equal zero. If the temperature doesn't change, then you've not changed the internal energy of that gas at all. You can change the pressure all day long and volume, but as long as the temperature remains constant, internal energy hasn't changed. This is not something that's easy to derive from anything that's over here, but definitely something. This is really important. You need to remember that. We can extrapolate one more thing out of this. If delta U is zero, then what else is true? Well, plug in zero and tell me what you get. Express it. Good. Another relation they might ask you to pull out. Okay. <coughs> so let's go to an isochoric process. Isochoric process. So delta V is zero. And if delta V is zero, then you might figure out that there's no expansion work done whatsoever. If the gas didn't expand or get compressed, huh, sweet. No work performed on or by the gas. And this, this assumption, though, makes, assumes that there's no other type of work going on. Expansion work is not the only type of work, but in this chapter where we're doing a lot of problems with the gases, it's usually the one we consider. Technically, I can do work in other forms. You know, I could put a, a spinning wheel that is you know, being run by a battery. And as it spins, it'll be doing work, adding energy into that system and stuff. But we're, not, we're excluding all those possibilities right now. So if there's no volume change, there's no expansion work. And this assumes that there's no other type of work going on either. Cool. And if there's no other type of work going on either, then what else is true? Delta U equals Q. Delta U equals Q. And because delta U equals Q, this is constant volume again. If you recall, what was the constant volume heat capacity? So CV, what was CV equal to? And so if I rearrange this, what was delta U equal to? <coughs> CV delta T. But because we're at constant volume, what is delta U equal to? Q. And so we just found out for a constant volume process, that's how you're going to get Q. And technically, if again you use the ultimate definition, the real definition would have been Q equals the integral of CV dt. Cool. If CV is a constant, then you bring it out, right? Oh, and I should have put delta t here. Ah. But if CV is a constant number over the entire temperature range you're looking at, it pulls out front. <laughs> and what's the integral of dt? Delta t. And you end up here. 
But every once in a while, somewhere down the road, we're going to give you some CV values. And it turns out that heat capacities over small ranges are usually pretty constant. They're fixed. Like when we said that, you know, the specific heat capacity of, say, water was 4.18 joules per gram Kelvin, well, it's not really true. That's the kind of average over the whole range of temperatures for water. But you know, as you go to higher temperatures, it changes a little bit. And as you go to lower temperatures, it's a little bit different from that as well. Well, if we account for that, instead of giving you a constant number right there, I give you an equation. And I say that you know, it's equal to like 47 plus 0.01 times T. And that way, as the temperature changes, the CV value changes. Well, then all of a sudden, you've got to take that can't pull out front. You'll plug that equation in, and you've got to do some, some calculus in that case. Basic integrals, but a little bit of calculus. All right, polish this off. Gone to isochoric. Let's go to isobaric. What does isobaric mean again? Constant pressure. So no change in the pressure. And if there's no change in the pressure, you might look and be like, I really don't see anything. Well, work is P delta V. But it's delta V, not delta P in work, right? So that's not really going to do anything against us. So you might not see it initially. So we've got to do a little extrapolation to get there. So but it turns out that when delta P is 0, we're going to find that that ultimately means, end of the day, that delta H equals Q. And we often specifically put a little P down here to make sure that we remember, oh yeah, this was at constant pressure. But delta H and Q are the same thing if we carry out a reaction at constant pressure. If you recall, when we say like the words endothermic and exothermic, what would delta H be for an endothermic reaction versus an exothermic? Well, delta H is positive number for endothermic and negative number for exothermic. And we talk <laughs> about heat being absorbed or lost. That's why. Because when we carry out a reaction on a normal desktop, where the pressure is constant in an open beaker and stuff, great, they have the same thing. If it's you know, a sealed container, they're not the same thing. But we do a lot of reactions on the desktop in an unsealed environment. Works out well. So let's derive this. I'm going to erase everything but that last one. So this is one of your more complex derivations, but then one you can derive from all your first principles, and you should definitely be able to do. So let's look at this for a sec. If we go here, we want to prove ultimately that when the pressure's not changing, that delta H is equal to Q. Where do I start? Well, I should start with delta H. There's my delta H equation. What do I do to demonstrate that? Common test question. Show me that that's true. So what do I do? Let's put delta U and substitute in right there. That way, at least I got a Q showing up. And so in this case, if I take Q plus W and substitute in, we get delta H equals Q plus W plus delta PV. Ooh, why is delta PV equal to 0? Ooh, delta P is 0, but that doesn't mean delta PV is 0. So care for it. Notice delta P is not the same thing as delta PV. This whole product, if P stays constant but V changes, then this whole product here changes, right? So we can't really say that just because delta P is 0 that, that the whole thing comes out to 0. It doesn't work that way. So a couple things we can do. One thing to note, we're not going to do it in this case, but for, if I was talking about a perfect gas, what would delta PV be equal to? for a perfect gas? Delta nRT. If it's delta PV, then it would equal delta nRT. That's one place you might go for some future calculations involving perfect gases. We're not going there. So, but when we've got a product here, we can actually expand that out. It turns out delta PV is the same thing as P delta V plus V delta P. Expand it out into two sets of derivatives, if you will. Cool. Here's the other side of the coin. I want to prove that delta H is Q, which means that everything else needs to cancel. OK. What's work when we have constant pressure?
What is it? Negative P delta V. <coughs> awesome. Negative P delta V plus P delta V, they cancel. And if we're carrying this out now, you're, you will, if we're carrying this out at constant pressure, then this term is zero. And what are we left with? Delta H equals Q. And again, we usually put that little super, your subscript P, just remember to remind ourselves that this was only true at constant pressure because we carried it out at constant pressure. <coughs> Everybody cool with that? That's your hardest derivation. And again, there are certain derivations that I couldn't care less if you know. But the couple we've gone over here, worth knowing. Common test questions that show up you know, a fourth of the time. So let's do one more thing. Last thing. CP minus CV equals NR. If you recall, I said which one's usually bigger, CP or CV? CP is bigger. Turns out it's bigger by NR. So this typically usually applies to a perfect monatomic gas. We'll get more complex systems later, but perfect monatomic gas, your book takes the time to derive this. It's a common question that I've seen in the past myself, actually, on an exam back in the day. So we're going to take the time to derive it and kind of go through it. So if you recall, what's CP equal to? And C, yeah, CP was delta H over delta T and CV. Delta U over delta T. Cool. So if we plug these in here, delta H over delta T minus delta U over delta T equals NR. Cool. And then I'm going to multiply through both sides by delta T. Actually, this is what I want to do. My bad. I actually want to show that it's equal to NR. So I just want to start with CP minus CV. And I'm going to demonstrate that it ends up equaling NR. So I think I'm doing this right. Or maybe I had what I wanted to have here just a second ago. And you know what? Yeah, let's just leave it like this. So what is delta H? First principles. Delta U plus delta PV all over delta T. And what, we'll just leave that as delta U over delta T. And so if we expand this out a little further, <coughs> take a little room, we'll get delta U over delta T plus delta PV over delta T minus delta U over delta T. And we see our delta U's over delta T's cancel. What's delta PV equal to for a perfect gas? Delta NRT. And so in this case, this turns into delta NRT over delta T. But notice, if I've got a specific sample of gas, then is the moles of gas changing? No. Is the gas constant ever going to change? No. Then any change in this must require the fact that it's T that's changing. And so this turns into NR delta T over delta T. And at the end of the day, we're left with NR. Now we've showed that CP minus CV equals NR. Good times. I would probably go back the CP minus CV, the fact that delta H equals Q. So, and go back and drive those for yourself a couple times before your exam, just so that you know you can do it on your own without having to look back at anything. May or may not show up on your test, but it's worth your time to know. Questions? <coughs> 